anyway, before, while we're doing that, just the subject um, for the topic is about uh, maintainer workflows. Yep, I got it, Ted, thank you. And we are going to discuss what we're doing with uh, lorecron.org, specifically with uh, tools like before and another tool I'm going to mention, which is called LEI or Lay. And there's a pun there that I will come to in, uh, in due time. All right, let's get started. See if I can paginate this. There we go. In the beginning, there was email. Oh, by the way, if you want to ask questions, just type it in the chat. It's open right there. I will see it. It's a lot easier than trying to figure out if you're unmuted or if your camera is working or anything. As I'm going along, ask the question in the chat. Um, I will periodically make sure to look over there and see if there's a question. All right, so starting off. In the beginning, that was email. Um, as everybody knows, about 30 years ago, Lena sent an email or rather a Usenet post to um, a news group saying that he's starting this little project that is totally not professional or anything like that. And uh, everybody enjoyed using email, sending an email to news groups, uh, receiving them in the mailing list, and everything was good. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'll be here all week, literally. All right. Anyway. Joke one, I'm um, off the list, check mark. All right, RFC 2822 is actually the standard. There's actually a newer standard, but, but everybody's used to seeing it they called RFC 2822. It's the standard that describes the format of the message, not specifically the protocol over which the message is delivered. So Usenet um, works with RFC 2822 messages, of course. This was the lists before the lists. The email existed alongside, but everybody who needed to share communication over um, a, a large group of people used uh, Usenet. It was nice, but um, and it was decentralized. It was it started out at Duke University, where I worked for uh, quite some time. So this is like a shout out to my old workplace. Uh, it didn't really deal well with abuse because of its decentralized nature. It was really hard to monitor um, who is allowed to post messages, who is not allowed to post messages. So. After a little while, uh, Usenet just turned into something that is either um, illegal or spam or both or anyway. So everybody jumped ship to mailing lists, which is uh, what Linux kernel development community did or the web boards, which is also um, something that happened in the past. Unfortunately, abuse has since intensified. It didn't really solve anything. Um, there was continued centralization for the mailing lists and for uh, especially especially for web boards um, and there are certain important downsides to web boards spam continued on web boards so we didn't really solve a problem there we just needed larger and larger anti-spam protection mechanisms we uh, started introducing things like spf for email and dkim for email and dmark for email and unfortunately what ended up happening is that uh, it broke delivery from many many mailing lists which is not really the fault of DKIM. It's the fault of how we did used to do mailing lists. If you ever set up a mailing list, you know that there's an option to add the little thing to the subject and the little thing to the footer. And I would do things like strip attachments and everything like that. Unfortunately, all of these nice and little neat measures ended up uh, breaking uh, DMARC and specifically DKIM signatures. So um, it's e actually easy to do both DMARC and lists. Uh, I have a little uh, discussion on how best to do it. You can ask, go ahead and do it. Uh, you click on that link in the, in the PDF file if you want to download it, or just Google DMARC and mailing lists. They're not mutually exclusive. It's a, it's a myth that they are. You can actually set up a mailing list that, that, that uh, as long as messages are DKIM signed, that is perfectly uh, DMARC valid. So, and as I mentioned, RFC 2822 is actually not protocol specific. Messages do not need to arrive via SMTP. And we'll discuss other alternatives in the next future. So why are we still using email, right? Well, if you think about it, email remains the only standard interoperable, widely used point-to-point -point messaging system. Um, the only thing that came kind of close to this was XMPP, and it's kind of slowly dying at this time because every major vendor has killed support for XMPP. It is decentralized, as I mentioned. It is also, importantly, vendor neutral. If you're working at Google and you need to communicate with somebody at Microsoft, you can send an email from Google to Microsoft, and you can expect it to arrive. It may get mangled. It can get uh, quarantined if you did something strange or the SMTP gateway didn't like it, but most of the time, an email that you send from one vendor um, to another vendor gets accepted, processed, and shows up in the inbox. 
It also provides full address portability. This is uh, assuming that you use your own domain. For example, my own domain, I switched at least four or five different providers, preserving my own uh, domain name and my own email address. If I started, didn't, I didn't like one, I can always move to a different one. Uh, there's no, no uh, sort of penalties for doing that. You can do it as, as often as you like. Uh, so this gives you uh, the freedom to do so. You can host on your own as well. Importantly, email, since the DKIM introduction, provides strong domain level attestations. There are signatures, cryptographic signatures, that's part of the headers that allow you to verify that an, that an email was sent from a specific domain, that it passed their um, signing uh, protocols, that, that, that before it left the specific vendor, that the message was signed with their uh, cryptographic signature. You can download it, you can verify it, as long as the uh, domain record continues to exist, you can continue doing so for the time, anytime in the future. And also importantly, we kind of managed to handle abuse by with introduction of DKIM and DMARC. It's not great, you still receive a lot of spam, but um, what continues to happen is that we are, uh, it's not really the fault of email, it's just the fault of any system that is uh, that receives enough eyeballs will get uh, abused this way. We've seen this happening to uh, every other mechanism, every other communication platform out there. I've had, um, you know, Facebook, I've had uh, Telegram, anything, I receive spam on all of them. So it's not really something that is just specific to email. And email is actually pr more problematic to protect primarily because it is decentralized. There is no one place where you can um, f filter out all of the accounts filter out all of the spammers. Another interesting part of email is that it allows for mixed messages. And this is not, I don't mean a double entendre. I mean that there's multiple parts in the MIME standard. You can say this part is for humans. This part is dedicated for robots. This is an attachment file that you don't have to render. You can just let the, um, the human download it. This is useful if, for example, you want to say, uh, this is a notification for you. This is what this notification is about. If you want to process this notification, there is a part that's specifically aimed at your processing engine that you can you can feed this message to, and uh, the the processor will know what to do with that. And an important part of this is that and this is what all the uh, kernel developers will tell you is that everything is in one place. Uh, this is important. One of the downsides of the web boards is that if you uh, if you ever had a situation where you posted something on the internet and multiple news, um, uh, news websites uh, had a piece about it, you would then go to all of these news websites to check the comments to see if you need to comment there. And the Hacker News, do you maybe need to comment something? I know WN, did the register post something in the comment? You usually you just ignore the comments and register anyway, so I'll forget that example. But uh, this is a problem that you would have to go and check multiple uh, sources on the internet to see if you need to respond to something, I need to correct somebody's misconceptions about your work and so forth. As opposed to everything just arrives in your inbox, right? If there is a notification, if there, you don't need to just click and link, everything is right there, you can just reply in line and uh, you don't need to create an account anywhere. You don't need to um, you know, navigate through a weird system of comments that they might have or so forth. This is why Email still rules for a lot of the uh, stuff that we have to do. As I mentioned, um, the problem with um, having multiple different systems where you have to go and check things is that uh, maintainers don't scale. And there is what I call the death by 10,000 shortcuts. Uh, once you learn shortcut to do something very efficiently, very quickly, it is extremely difficult to uh, unlearn that and to learn something new and totally different. Uh, or it is even more difficult to have multiple sort of namespaces for if I'm on this site, this is the set of shortcuts I have to use. If it's an, if I'm on this site, this is a different set of shortcuts I have to use. For example, if you're a Garrett user, then you have to have a certain set of um, shortcuts. This is what I have to remember. If you're going then to GitHub, it's a totally different set of shortcuts. If you're then on Gmail, it's again, a different set of shortcuts. Our brains don't really work that way. One of my biggest problems is that if I need to post copy paste something from a terminal or from a website to the terminal to the terminal of course it's control shift c and the website is control c and half the time i just open developer tools 
because I clicked the wrong shortcut. Um, an example is Linus maintains micro Emacs because of what he calls muscle memory. He learned a set of shortcuts back when he was a student in, uh, in Finland. And micro Emacs worked with Finnish, um, one of the best tools back at the time. And so he still has trouble relearning the set of shortcuts to work with any other tool. So he continues to maintain and use micro Emacs, even though he's probably the only user in the world at this time. There's obligatory X XKCD reference. You probably saw that one. It's about the guy who um, uh, refuses to join the interplanetary cloud of conscience because he just likes his IRC interface. We all have been there. So we want maintainers to focus on maintaining and not remembering which shortcuts they should use on which website. And uh, if something is working well for a maintainer, our goal is to avoid breaking it. I call this don't break maintainer flow, kind of like don't break user space is the mantra for the Linux kernel. I tried to stick to don't break maintainer flow for the past uh, 10 years that I've been doing the same thing. Sometimes it is inevitable because a tool may just stop being supported or it is costing us way too much money to support this specific workflow for one person that may be using it that may be able to switch to something else with uh, relative ease. Fairly recently, I shut down a patchwork for LKML which nobody really was using except maybe one or two people. And I hopefully was able to provide them with alternatives. There was one time when I turned off, you, should, you used to be able to do finger kernel.org and receive the status of the latest kernel releases. I turned that off as if one of the first things when I first started kernel.org and oh my God, I received uh, complaints about it for the like three, four years after that. Why? Um, what I'm trying to say is that mail user agent I used to say MUT everywhere because I assume everybody uses MUT, but it's not true. So I'm, uh, when you see MUA, you just assume it says MUT because in my head it does. So MUA workflows allow maintainers to scale. What they're able to do is they have a set of shortcuts. They have a set of workflows that um, they're used to that are extremely efficient at grabbing patches, grabbing conversation, replying to conversations, reviewing code. And they are really good at this. And for them to th learn something else, takes time and effort, an effort that they would otherwise be uh, spending on actually making Linux better or applying the patches that developers have sent. All right, any questions at this time? None so far, this was kind of an introduction and I'm going to lean into actual tooling that we built around this. All right, so patches sent via email. Uh, patches are conversations, if you think about that, right? Uh, when you receive a patch, it's got everything that is a conversation. If somebody approached you on a, at a conference and started talking to you, say, hey, my name is Alex Eagerdev. You know, I have a suggestion that you have a cool feature. So this is how you do it now. I think you should do it this way. And if you look at the patch, this is literally what exactly what it is, right? It says a from. It's got a subject of the conversation. It's got a date when the conversation happened. It's got a commit message, which is the explanation of what you're trying to do and what the, the results that you're trying to achieve. And it's got the actual patch. And the patch is, of course, showing you this is your current code, and this is what I suggest your code should be. Um, and um, this is extremely efficient for a maintainer to look through it because they know the code. They know exactly where this code lives. Uh, and it's easy for them to just do a reply, reply all, and just to go line by line or, or paragraph by paragraph and say, yeah, this is good. I don't think you should be doing it this way. I think you should be doing it better or our coding standards are slightly different. Please change it this way. And the interleaved email replies that um, everybody uses are our natural way of doing that. It's very ext extremely efficient for somebody to do it in their email client, much more efficient than going to a website, finding this, this, this line of code uh, and, and making comments there. This is what I've heard from multiple current developers in the past. And it is a great workflow for code reviews. Unfortunately, it's not so great for literally anything else that happens after the code review is complete, right? This is what I call this the old maintainer workflow, right? You, once you're done with the code review and you want to actually apply the patches that you've received to, the, to, a, to a, a Git tree, you would save the submission as an inbox file from your, um, from your uh, user agent or you would use a tool like Quilt if you're um, uh, doing this along, uh, been doing it for a while. If it's an inbox, it may not save the patches in the right for, in the right order. You would have to like literally manually change the patch one goes here, patch two out of 10 goes here, and this is extremely 
uh, bothersome to do it, uh, but you almost always have to do it with an inbox because they can arrive, could have arrived at any order really. Then if there's somebody said, uh, send a follow-up saying, yeah, I reviewed this or I tested this, you have to manually go through all of the replies and say, this is an act by, this is reviewed by, this is tested by so-and-so. Then you make a Git branch, apply the inbox file, merge into your main branch, and then provide as much relevant info as possible in the actual merge message. Linux complains about Linux complains us about it a lot when you when you just have a, a, a useless uh, commit a merge message. You should uh, pay attention to this. Then you send it to an upstream maintainer, either that's Linus if you're sending pull requests directly to him, or your upstream maintainer uh, to pull your request. And of course, the problem that eventually became blindingly obvious is that we needed good email archives to do this. Um, specifically for the decision crumb trail, right? When you copy pasted, they're reviewed by and tested by and act by, there was other than your inbox and the inbox and the outbox of the person who sent those, there's no confirmation saying that this, this person actually did this, that you didn't just come up with this on your own. This was kind of the honor code between maintainers to, to make sure that when you put that in, that, that you didn't just make that up, right? So uh, email archives, uh, good email archives, are, uh, allowed us to make sure that everything that goes into the commit message, all of the sign-offs and all of the um, decisions, we can actually trace them and figure this out. This is public information, publicly available on a public archive site. And before, about three years, well, four years, three years ago, I think, the, um, they used, we used gmain.org, which was great. Um, there was lkml.org, which was less great because it's uh, just the Linux kernel mailing list, which is not actually used by anybody really specifically. Uh, I think almost everybody sees it, but no, almost nobody really pays attention to it because it's just like a fire hose. So what we needed, and this was becoming more and more obvious, especially after the gmain.org had a meltdown and went offline for a couple of months. Okay, mail.org kept happening, uh, kept having um, outages um, and, and not accessible. But we needed a distributed archives. And also the archives that are also continuously updated uh, and replicated. Uh, and distributed part was important because we didn't want to be kind of the, the, the central site where everything is checked, right? If we are down and we're back to the similar problem of, well, kernel.org is down, where do I get my information? Um, so we looked at public inbox. Public the inbox has some really cool features in it. One, it has a clonable backend. All of the archives that, that, that it stores are actually Git repositories themselves. You can clone the entirety of, uh, of lorekernel.org uh, and, and have the full copy of it locally. And you can uh, you can do you can actually set up a full mirror of lorekernel.org on your own. It has, in addition to Git repositories, it, it indexes all the messages in the Git repositories and provides fast search capabilities on the um, HTTPS front end. It uses Zapien for that, which is a public, um, which is open source project, free software project. In addition to just providing good search results, it is also extremely developer friendly search results. You can have prefixes that specifically are aimed at patch workflows. For example, if you have DFN, that matches the file names from diffs. For example, if you want to go to lowercurl.org slash all and look for DFN maintainers, you can find all the patches that modify the maintainers file. DFHH, uh, it looks for hunk header context, right? Uh, this is what, um, when you say git diff, and it will provide the at and the function name. This you can look for all of the patches that actually modify your favorite function. Like in this example, I have APEG bus freak is, is known just randomly when they picked. You can even find, for example, give me a patch that changed this file to be the following hash. There's a DF post um, search for that. Like I mentioned, lowkernel.org can be mirrored in its entirety. In fact, um, with the recent iteration, lowkernel.org is actually three geo-distributed mirror nodes. It's not, um, it's not the, the main source of data. It, it mirrors it from our backend system. It is 100% free software. Anyone, and I, and I want to stress this, that anyone at any time can set up a full clone and keep it updated. Uh, documentation is, as always, lacking a little bit. I'll try to provide 
complete docs and how do you, you would be able to do that, but it is actually easy to do and easy to set up. So if you're working from a large company that uh, uses the uh, archival features all the time, or you just want to just set it up on your own because you're interested in doing something like this, or if you're digging uh, you know, for fossils in the, in the archival record, I suggest instead of querying lower kernel rogue directly, that you go ahead and set up a local copy. It's easy to do. Now, it started out as just an archival collection site, but what we soon realized is that it allows for greater workflow automation on top of that. And this is where the tool came, uh, I came up with a tool called B4. And the name is a Star Trek reference. I blame V'ger for this. Uh, V'ger kernel.org is the um, main mailing list site, right? Then uh, Lore, of course, um, is, an, is a brother of data, which is a Star Trek reference. And B4 is a prototype Android that, had, that was before uh, data and Lore. And, and this is actually a terrible name because when you're looking for, searching for B4, it's a valid hex code. So all of the hex dumps also match. This is, this is I, I kick myself every time when I actually have tried to find something that's related to B4. Mea culpa, unfortunately, it's too late to change that at, at this point. Now you can install it fairly easily from PyPI. It's written in Python. It's, um, um, if you don't like PyPI, you can clone the repo and just run pip install uh, requirements that text. Uh, there's only a few requirements that are even not required. There, it, it, it's, it will pull in things like DK invalidation and uh, some of the uh, cryptographic attestation libraries, but you can absolutely run it without them. So you can just clone it from Git. It's on gitkernel.org, you can find it there. And uh, you can probably install it from your distro too, but it's probably got an older version. And it seemed quite wide adoption by maintainers, I'm trying to be humble here, but uh, I think a lot of maintainers are using it right now and uh, it saves them a lot of time and effort. I'm going to go through some of the major features. Probably most of you already know about them, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about this. Um, before Mbox, allows to grab whole threads from lorecurrent.org, right? And the threads, what is important, are aggregated from across all lists. They're not just from one specific list. So the cool thing about it is when, for example, you get CC'd, your list, the, your, the list, that you, list that you're monitoring gets CC'd in the middle of a um, discussion, such if you wanted to see the entire context of this discussion be, be before what actually happened before you got CC'd, you can look for that message ID and lower kernel wrong slash all, and you can grab the entire thread. And before mbox, you can add threads to an existing mailbox. So that command, for example, right there, before mbox fo mail, assuming your um, mail is where your mail dear is, you can download the entire thread, filter out the dupes that you already have, and add them to your uh, mailbox. And there's a macro index for, that's the command you can add to uh, before, to, to your MUT uh, RC, for example, so that if you come to a thread that you're missing context on, you can just hit four. This will grab the entire thread from Lore Kernel Network Archive and add it to your inbox. This is, uh, like I said, great uh, feature that I use all the time, actually. Now, before I am is um, probably what is most known to maintainers. It's a bit of workhorse, workhorse. It gets the thread like a before inbox does. But then it processes it by looking for any follow-up trailers like received by, act by, I mean, uh, act by, uh, tested by, and so forth. It will add them to the patch uh, that, that uh, was actually sent. It will also check DKIM signatures if the library is present. It will check for crypto attestations that we'll talk about in a moment. It will make an mbox file or a mail dir file that you can pass to git am to actually apply the patch in its ready form to, uh, to your git tree. Now it doesn't, what people don't realize, it doesn't need to use lorecurrent.org. By default, it will go out and get uh, stuff from lore. But if you pass the dash M, you can look in your local inbox, uh, local inbox to, uh, to get everything from your local source. So if you're offline and you want to be able to use before, you can just, as long as you have everything locally, you can use it uh, without the um, online presence. Um, it's important. Yeah, just look at before am dash dash help. There's a bunch of commands there. Some of them are lesser known features that I think are cool. So I'm going to mention them here. The dash g or guess base. Uh, it will look at git index 
if you've seen the patch that's made by Git, it shows the indexes of the files that are being modified. So the guest base will try to look in your local tree, as long as you run this from a local tree, it will try to find where in the tree this patch is without conflicts. This is useful if you want to be able to apply the patch and know that there are not going to be any conflicts. It does not mean that this is where the patch actually belongs. I always provide this caveat that sometimes you just don't know if, um, you know, it depends on something in a different file that it doesn't mention. That is a function that it relies on. But if you're only using, the, if, you, if you need to be able to apply this without any um, conflicts, that's the, something to look at. Now the prep three-way, uh, it gets your local tree ready for a three-way patching. I said, I don't know actually what this means. It's not exactly true. I know exactly what this means because I actually wrote this feature, but I don't actually use it a lot. So I assume it's useful and people tell me it's useful. So I mentioned it there. Uh, dash C is kind of a hack that a lot of people rely on actually. If you received a patch series, as long as the subject and the author haven't changed, you can check if there is a, if you have a V3, maybe there's somebody posted a V4 or the same author posted a V4 or V5. If you patch dash C, you can actually try to find the newer version on the, uh, on more kernel org. Now, before diff, I find is cool, but since I'm not a kernel developer, I don't usually have the trees that, um, that are required to make this operation. But if you have a V3 and a V4, for example, you can pass a V4 diff message ID and it will show you the range diff between V3 and V4. So this kind of keeps contributors honest when you say, when you respond to V3, yeah, make this change. And the, the author says, yeah, I made this change. Allowing, doing the git uh, before diff is, um, uh, makes you, allows you to verify that they, what they actually changed is what they say they changed. It keeps contributors honest. It requires that the index objects uh, are present in the tree. We try to recreate them before we run this diff. So we kind of create fake ranges. So there's some cool git magic happening in the backend. As long as you have all of the initial indexes in your tree, we should be able to make this work. If not, it will just say, unfortunately, I don't, don't have these, these indexes. If you know from which tree this is, add it as, as your remote and pull it, and then we'll be able to present this for you. <clears throat> so before PR is if you receive a lot of batch uh, pull requests, this will help you process them. Uh, before PR message ID will fetch the request into the fetch head. It will actually, something I didn't mention here, it will check if it's already been applied. So if you don't remember if you've processed this or not, it will tell, oh, actually, this is already in your tree, so you don't need to do anything about it. This will check the PGP signature on the tag or on the commit, as long as that's in your um, um, in the local PGP keyring, it will give you verified uh, hash, uh, verified check mark. It, it will also verify the commit SHA that it mentions in the message actually matches what the commit is on the remote because i find that sometimes what happens and people say please pull up to the following sha and when you actually pull it the remote sha is different from that so that uh, so the remote either didn't get pushed or it didn't get mirrored yet or the uh, maintainer also oh i forgot to do this so i'm going to sneak in another commit there so you will check and say oh actually the remote that you've just pulled is not matching what the sha says in the message so that we'll do this verification one of the cool things I also do will do dash dash explode. It can turn a pull request into individual commits. So it will turn a pull request into a patch series, basically. It will add all the twos and CCs from the original pull request. So you can actually, uh, if there is a, if you pulled something and you don't like something about it, you can turn it into a, a series of, of patch requests, of, patch, of, of patches and, and uh, reply to individual patches. So you don't need to find the place in the code. You can just do usual code review using this mechanism. And uh, as you know, some of you know, I'm working on the GitHub or Git Forge integration using the PR bot. It'll soon be offered as automation. I haven't got around to it fully yet because we needed to get newer version of lore kernel that were in place before we could do that. And something that is, I think, seeing a lot of use is the D4QI, which stands for thank you. It automates the thanks, this has been applied um, responses to, to uh, for maintainers. There's an auto thankinator gun, which I named maybe because I watched too many Phineas and Ferb episodes with my kids. You can, uh, it will look at all the patches and series you've downloaded with before AM or before PR, 
you will try to find these series and these pull requests in your local tree. So you have to run this from a local tree. And it will say, well, you've downloaded this series and I can see that you, as your author, has applied them, uh, merged them into your tree. So I'm going to create a dot thanks file that is pre sort of a cookie cutter response to the submitter. You can then do a git send email for the thanks file. I will also eventually add this so you will, you will be able to send directly from before. All right, any questions so far? None, all right, good, my goodness. Maybe it's just so early that people are just not really awake yet. Okay, before I test, yes, Ted. Uh, yeah, just a quick administrative point. Um, some folks may be having trouble connecting to the chat. Uh, there are chat issues which the planning committee is working on and Constantine that might be uh, one of the reasons why uh, you're not seeing any questions on the chat. Uh, the shared notes is working um, so folks could switch to the shared notes or we may need to fall back to activating your camera and asking questions until the chat uh, issue is resolved. Uh, some folks are on but a lot of people have not been able to log into the chat and we apologize for the inconvenience. They're working on resizing the Linode server. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let me go through the rest of the B4 features and then I'll have an option for people to ask questions. I want to get to uh, the lay stuff that is actually what the latest coolness is. So before I test, is, I don't want to go too deep into this because I've been working uh, on a separate presentation that will be part of the Linux Security Summit that's happening um, a week and a half from now. And this would, this adds cryptographic attestation to patches uh, by basically hijacking the Dikim standard and, 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 and using it for our needs. So this will add signatures to the email headers. So if you're just using any tooling that does not is not aware of the signatures, it will completely ignore them. It will just look like a regular message. But if you're using B4, for example, you will be able to see uh, messages that have been cryptographically signed, and it will show it to you in a, um, yeah. This is how it will look like when you run B4AM with a patch uh, that actually has cryptograph cryptographic attestation. It will say that it's, it, it will check both the DKIM and then if it finds a PGP signature header, it will say this is also signed by OpenPGP Casecook um, at Chromium.org. If there is anything wrong with the message, it's been in any way, shape, or form modified, like the subject modified, or the uh, from is modified, or the body is modified, it will you'll give you the bad zig, and then you will know that no, oh, something is wrong here. So you can go and review the message and see what's actually is not correct about it. If you're interested in this more, um, please. Um, check out the Linux Security Summit presentation that's a week and a half from now, or just go to Patat is the library that is called. Uh, Patat is uh, right there. And, and check out what it does. Start using it, dang it. So I'm not a kernel developer. Uh, I don't actually participate in the kernel development process. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very close bystander. I see a lot of it. Uh, so I'm aware of a lot of stuff that's going on, but sometimes I assume things and I'm wrong. Uh, there is something I think it should be working this way, but you think it should be working totally different because the way I made it work is actually fairly inconvenient. So I welcome this feedback and please, please, please sub submit it to me. Don't just, uh, if, if you find a, a, a quirk in before that you don't actually think is useful, tell me. Um, I will try to modify it so it actually does useful what is useful for most Chrome developers. You can email tools at linuxkernel.org. Uh, that's probably the best place to do it. Um, that's it. That's that's all about before. Any questions? Uh, chat's not working right now, so uh, I'm going to check the shared notes. Okay, nothing in shared notes. I'm going to plow on. And at the end, if depending on how much time we have left, I will ask all of the questions or answer at least all of them. Uh, so death by 10,000 mailing lists. Some other problem that we've come across is that there is, and it's actually a common misconception, 
that there is no such thing as a Linux kernel mailing list, right? There is Linux kernel at Viger, which is usually referred to as LKML, but it, 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 a lot of stuff is CC'd to it and a lot of stuff is sent to it, but nobody's actually reading it. It's, it's kind, of, kind of like yelling into a firehouse. Maybe a like couple of people who are very dedicated, maybe able, maybe like looking at what happens on the, on the Linux kernel mailing list. But uh, most of the time, it's just uh, stuff is there as, as um, write only. A few people read that. So there is a V'ger kernel.org, there's infradev, there's linux.dev now. Where do I send this patch, right? How do I know uh, that the patches that I send will be actually seen by the maintainer that this is aimed at? Um, Getmaintainer.pl in the Linux tree will help you but uh, it is kind of daunting for one of contrib contributors, right? You have to know that, that you need to run it. Uh, you need to know to, that it needs to run it as part of git send email. It it's, it's, can be complicated to people, for folks, right? So can we harness the power of lower kernel work for good or for more good, for gooder? The new tool that uh, is actively under active development is um, the public inbox local email interface, it's LEA. And if uh, there's, there's a joke here, is Lorelei, as uh, of course is a common uh, common name. So uh, Lay is uh, is a, is a tool that can query remote sources and deliver them locally into your mailbox, or it can deliver them to your IMAP fold, IMAP folder. I'll demonstrate in a moment. It supports search-based queries. It can deliver to local mail dears to remote IMAP targets, and it can query lorecurl.org slash all. What does it mean? Let's take a look at the maintainer's file, right? This is just a random uh, subsystem that I grabbed because it looked convenient, right? Let's look at the bits that are F and K lines. If you don't know what maintainer's file is, the F file says, this subsystem is responsible for the following files. Documentation device tree, RSD, drivers, OF overlay, drivers OF resolver, and K is the uh, rejects of any of the context queries, right? If, if there's a function that's called, OF overlay notifier blank whatever. This this it belongs to the subsystem. They want to know about it. So let's take a look at how we can use this to formulate a lower kernel network query. So these F lines and K lines translate directly to the following query, like the DFN, 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 or DF context, OF overlay notifier, right? If anything that mentions OF overlay notifier, I want able to be able to find it. And if you, if you download the PDF presentation of this and you click on this, you will find the results of this query. So, Lay allows you to run this query and deliver it in results into your local inbox or into your IMAP folder, right? There's a LEAQ-O is an important part here. Uh, deliver it to my local mail deal folder, right? Query the remote, a lower kernel network slash all, and uh, the dash T, it says grab the entire threads, right? It's not just the matching messages, but the entire thread. If, for example, if you want to see the context of the, of the conversation, if somebody mentioned your function name or your subsystem in a message somewhere deep in the, in the thread conversation, you want to, for example, grab the entire thread so it can review exactly what happened and, uh, to lead to that uh, mention. Um, you may not want that. It can bring totally random, completely irrelevant threads, and or you may want to just grab the and then uh, grab the the actual message. And if you're interested, you can hit the remember the four key that I mentioned. Just just backfill that from from uh, from local that org. Now RT men, it means received date, right? It says show me all the results that have been received six months ago until now. The dot dot uh, nothing means. Uh, it's, a, it's an open-ended query. So starting from six months ago until now, because you probably don't want to receive the results for all for, for that have been sent you know, in the past five years. You probably want to change that to just one week ago. And you can also deliver it not just to local mail, mail dear, but also to a remote IMAP folder, remote IMAP folder. <clears throat> this is pretty cool. Um, I've been using it if if you're if you've received sort of a creepy uh, notif notification or res response from me when you mentioned before in your conversation. This is how I know about this. I'm not reading the entire mailing list, but if somebody mentions before somewhere in a conversation and I think this is something I should respond to, I will go ahead and reply. And this is how I've been tracking all of the mentions of before 
on the entirety of lower kernel network track mailing lists. So um, lay command has, once you run this query, right, you can edit the search um, that you've created. You can tweak search parameters. They're not uh, set in stone after that. You can change the RT to make it wider or narrower. Usually after the first run, if you grab the six months of the results, after that, you can just say, just show me the last week of results because I already have everything that's older than that. You can exclude things that you find that, that, that are not relevant with you, with and not with this uh, bracketed query. After you've modified the search, or if you want to get the latest results, you can do layup and then change the, um, and then pass the, the folder that uh, where you're saving this. IMAP folder also works. Uh, you can delete messages from the folder after they received that, after you received there. So it's not like you have to leave them there. You can delete them as usual. You reviewed them all. You can just delete them all. They will not get re-added because uh, Lay keeps track of messages it has elsewhere. If you if you create multiple search safe searches, you can just update them all at the same time with the dash dash all. Um, uh, there's any, any credentials that you have to use with an I, with IMAP server. You can save them in a. You can set up the Git credential helper and store them locally. Uh, this way, you don't have to continuously enter them. You can list the searches that you have sa saved. Uh, you can forget specific uh, folders. This will just forget the search, but not delete the results. So if you have a one-off one-off query that you find everything that mentioned in the back six months. After that, you're not interesting, interested in it, you can just forget the search and keep the results. All right. This is really cool stuff. Uh, is the status of it is it is under heavy development. So the, the examples that are provided work now. They may be, may be requiring a few modifications a couple of weeks from now. Um, the documentation is extremely sparse. So it is usual for, for a tool that is being actively developed. We hope to provide ample documentation once this uh, the feature stabilize. New features are forged all the time. Uh, literally, if you if you monitor the uh, public inbox mailing list, you notice you will notice that uh, there's a lot of work being done on Lay right now. You can install it locally if you want to play with it. I would completely uh, recommend that. You can read the install file if you're running uh, if you're running Podman and Toolbox and Fedora. I have Toolbox instructions on how to do that. Uh, it, you just run. You just click that link, download the PDF, click that link, or go to publicinbox.org slash meta and look for toolbox instructions. If you're in Fedora, that's uh, very easy to accomplish. And this gives us some uh, ability to do some cool ideas, right? We can do pseudo mailing lists, right? Can do, um, um, we can manage on our end sort of a query based search, right? We can offer them as a read only IMAP or PLP3, POP3 in the near future. And POP3 is important because, for example, in Gmail, you can say uh, source results, source this remote POP3 folder and add them to my inbox. This is kind of cool things you can do with Gmail. And it will allows you, it, it can let you do things like, instead of creating your own mailing list on your, for your own subsystem, you can just say, you can list the, uh, just send patches to the next kernel at vg.kernel.org. Uh, my saved search or pseudo mailing list will find anything that mentions the things that are important to me, right? Just mention my subsystem in the email. I'll see that because my saved search will will add it to my ma to my pseudo mailing list and I'll receive the results. Or just send patches to LKML. I'll find them. Uh, it doesn't matter. Or to any mailing list. It doesn't matter. I'll see them, right? What this allows us to do, this makes it easy to onboard new maintainers. So if somebody comes uh, on board and wants to replace uh, uh, your duties on a subsystem, instead of subscribing to like five, 10 different mailing lists, you can just say, just, just receive the following um, the pseudo mailing lists, or you can do run the following query, add the following pop three to your Gmail, uh, just source this uh, IMAP folder to, your, uh, to wherever you wanna do it. It's one of the options. Um, we can also potentially provide not just read only, but read wrap IMAP, read write IMAP for uh, individual maintainers. If you're a new maintainer coming on board, we can say we can source this pre saved pre, pre saved search query and deliver it to a IMAP folder that you can just subscribe to. And then you can delete things from it. You don't really need to subscribe to any other mailing lists. Anything that's relevant to this subsystem will be delivered to this IMAP folder. So what are the main goals of the stuff that we're doing? It's cool things, right? What are the goals, right? We're trying to help maintain a scale. We're trying to turn up the signal 
turn down the noise. A lot of patches arriving into your inbox is cool until you realize that's way too many patches and a lot of them are irrelevant. You can, you can pre-filter them out before they actually even show up to your inbox. It helps us keep things decentralized. Anybody can set up a full mirror of lorecurl.org. The mailing list still yes have to arrive to specific um, um, inboxes, but this also makes it easy to move a mailing list to some other place. Now, if you move it, you can just say, by the way, it lives now there, and, it, and we'll just modify and source them from a different place. Hopefully, this is not confusing or frustrating. You can do it yourself with the uh, lay command, but we also understand that it could be complicated to do it. So we're trying to see what things we can do on the kernel network side that will make it easy for you uh, by, by doing a lot of the hard work uh, on our end, like the pseudo mailing lists or the IMAP folders that we pre-filter results into. We're trying not to break maintainer flow. The goal is not to break maintainer flow. If you don't want to participate in any of this, we're not breaking anything. Subscribe to mailing list, receive the mail, anything that's working on you already, we're not breaking any of that. We're adding new tools and new features that you can use without disrupting any of the old stuff, right? Um, there's no flag day that everybody from now on has to use this new system. As we know, this works really poorly for everybody. And we all also want to simplify things for contributors, new contributors coming on board. We want to be able to say, doesn't matter, just send the patch here, people will see it. Or, or if you want to ask a question, just send it to this and mention the subsystem you're interested in. The person who is responsible for the subsystem will see it. That's it. How to keep in touch. There's three mailing lists you should know. I know this is, we're back to mailing lists. But we're still using mailing lists, so this is cool. Um, if you want to discuss maintainer workflows, what's working, what is not working for you, email workflows at vjurkernel.org. If you want to talk about the tooling before um, any of the other tools that, uh, that I provide on the kernel.org side, there's a tools at Linux kernel.org mailing list. It's different from Vger, historical reasons. Let's not talk about that, right? Or just mention before an email somewhere. I'll see it. This is totally normal and non creepy. I, I, I guarantee that. If you want to participate in development of lay, give feedback about the, your lay usage. There's a meta at publicinbox.org. It's, the, it's uh, developed by somebody else uh, in um, uh, working with Linux Foundation. All right, we are at 10.49, 10 minutes, five minutes for questions. If you have a question to ask, please go ahead and ask it. Uh, and there are two questions at the bottom of the shared notes, uh, Constantine. Okay. Yep. You want to take a quick look at that? What does the future, far, far future look like? Well, we, I, my goal is to add tooling that does not centralize things. And this is the hard part, right? We don't want to create an infrastructure that is completely central where um, it also makes it extremely easy to knock out or just have one place when an attacker has to concentrate their attention to completely knock out the, uh, the kernel development. If you have a Garrett server for a kernel or a GitHub repository for kernel, or our own GitLab repository, self-hosted, always me often mentioned that why don't you just have a self-hosted GitLab repository for curl.org. Problem is that we either have to have the beefy power of, uh, of GitHub or Microsoft or Google to be able to withstand denial of service attacks on that, or we shouldn't even bother because if, if we're creating infrastructure that can, can stop Linux development in its tracks for, you know, if there's a zero day, and then we have a denial of service that nobody can talk to each other to fix the zero day. And obviously this becomes an extremely tasty target. So we need to find a solution that uh, allows to keep Linux development decentralized and, and, and fault tolerant without, um, without making things any more complicated than it is right now. There is a product project called, um, I'm blanking out on that, a radical that, that uses um, that, that has a decentralized Git infrastructure with, um, unfortunately, too many crypto chain bits that I try to ignore. I, I understand why they're important, understand why they're focusing on some of the crypto parts, but I, what I really want to see is them uh, focus on social parts of coding, like receiving patches, reviewing patches, uh, keeping track of bug reports. And this is all supposedly coming 
So what I hope in a couple of years from now, we'll be able to say as an alternative for your subsystem is instead of just using emails, if you want to use uh, um, a radical or some other um, infrastructure like that, you can without making it central. What about integration with patchwork? Uh, patchwork and before using different um, are used for different things. Like before is read only, right? So you don't need to, uh, if you're not tracking state of patches, if you're not uh, delegating patches, anything like that, because you don't need to use uh, patchwork. If you are interested in features like this, right? If you want to be able to say, well, the, I've dealt with these patches, I've dealt with these pat and pull requests, uh, and I want to delegate the following things to a different reviewer, patchwork is a great tool that, that, can, um, that can work with you. Um, uh, Pytat library source is not in the same Git repo as before. It will, um, if it is a sub module that it can download and install. If you're installing before from a Git repo, you can run Git submodule in it and it will pull it in. Uh, DMARC does work in LKML. Uh, unfortunately, it, 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 so DMARC requires DKIM signatures to properly work. If, a, if there's no DKIM signature, but there is something, there is a, there is a stupid setup where there's a DKIM signature, but uh, there, there is a DMARC policy, but no DKIM signature, and that, that doesn't work at all with mailing lists. So if you're sending patches to, to, uh, to LKML, to V'ger, or to a number of other lists, then you want to set up DKIM. Unfortunately, if it's going through a mailman2 list, infrared, for example, then it's it breaks DKIM, and uh, if yeah somebody fixes that, that would be fantastic. We also provide Linux.dev mailing mail hosting, so uh, we try to be extremely DMARC uh, compatible there. So if you want a new mailing list, that's an option too. All right, I think I'm coming out of, coming up on time. Last question. Okay. Okay. Uh, I suggest that any further questions that you have, if it's specific to B4, send them to tools at Linux. If it's a workflow, like more of a wider scope, you know, how, how about we do this or how about we do that, that you send it to workflows at Viger and we'll be able to take it up from there. Dimitri, uh, Dimitri did, did you have one last question, Dimitri? Dimitri, right. did you have one last question? You're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Thank you for the great presentation. So I wanted to ask one question regarding the doomsday scenario you mentioned, like if, say, there is a super critical bug that brings the internet down. So I wonder what's your thoughts regarding if we, like, if we should optimize the developer uh, workflow for this case, because it looks like it's it's super rare, and uh, I would assume it can be handled using, say, email or some older mechanism. But like the thousands of the patches we have, I don't like it. It looks that they're penalized, but this potential scenario. The, yeah, thank you. So currently, currently we are resilient to the doomsday scenario, right? So if there's a zero day and kernel.org is DDoSed out of existence, then uh, individual developers can work with Linus directly. They can send email. Uh, if if Gmail is also targeted, then Linus can communicate via some other, other back channel saying, I have this email address nobody knows about, send me patches there. There are ways to attack that too, but currently it is it is too complicated to address that, right? So how do we make sure that we also have address the doomsday scenario and make it easy for automation. I understand that automation is a different subject here. It is hard to work with patches sent to mailing lists, even with all the tooling in place, and to be able to provide useful feedback about the features, uh, about, the, about the patches, like saying, especially when you don't know where in the tree the patch lives. Right. Um, I didn't want to go too deep into that because we would just be going down the very deep uh, rabbit hole with uh, how do we automate it better. But I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to provide tools that maintainers can use right now, and I wanted to leave out the how do we switch to a different workflow 
that that allows for better integration with um, automated tools uh, as, a, as a topic for a separate discussion. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ted, I'm ceding my place to the next presenter since they're supposed to come up in five minutes. Yes, uh, thanks, Constantine, um, for your presentation. Uh, I'm going to be dropping a drive link into the shared notes, and then I'm going to be copying um, all of the questions that were uh, put in the shared notes into that drive link. Um, I think there were one or two uh, questions that we didn't have time to answer. Um, so uh, I'll, like I said, I'm going to create a drive link, copy all the questions there. And then um, if you could maybe take a look at that and uh, answer, answer them in the uh, shared uh, Google Drive doc, uh, maybe that'll be a short-term workaround. Uh, and then I'm going to be clearing the shared notes for the next presentation. Um, so uh, that was, that was going to be my plan. And uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, giving your presentation. All right.